All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Pigeonhole Motorcycle Podcast. My guest today, Brian, hasn't listened to anything I've done. (laughs) (laughs) Is that a good intro? (laughs) He's a huge fan. He's a total (laughs) fanboy. We're talking all the way um, to Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio, right? Not Missouri? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, Skidmark Garage, which is one word I've learned, not two words, right? Skidmark. Right. Skidmark. Autocorrect word. always makes it two. Correct. Somebody else uh, took the two words? I believe so. There's there's one other guy, and I've kind of given him idle email threats like hey if you're going to continue to be a douchebag i'm going to have to ask a lawyer to make you change your name and sure uh does he have an address (laughs) (laughs) i'm kidding i'm kidding (laughs) guys all i get is angry calls from his customers asking where's my shipment what the fuck i ordered this for my camaro blah 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 blah." i'm like dude 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 you're calling the wrong number (laughs) <laughs> oh, I mean, it's once or twice a week. It's driving me nuts. That's crazy. Well, you should just tell them everything's ready. Just come pick it up. Oh, see, great idea. Turn the tables. Make him totally pay gonna a do bit. that. Yeah, I'm good sorry. Call. And this good, and this good influence was brought to you by Skidmark Garage, <laughs> the one-worded one. <laughs> so, Brian, tell. Okay, so. Anybody that's listening that doesn't know, I mean, uh, you have an awesome thing going on there. So first of all, let's cover uh, what Skidmark Garage is in general, and then we'll talk a little bit more about everything. In general, Skidmark Garage is a uh, community motorcycle garage. So it's DIY. There's no mechanics. Uh, You buy a membership, almost like a gym, and then you come in, and if you buy a one-month membership, then you get as many hours as you want in one month to use all the tools and store your bike here and put it on a lift and get the help and advice of all the other members that are working on their own stuff. And, uh, yeah, just become part of the community. Wow. So uh, this is very community based. Extremely. Yeah. There's uh, more than I ever thought it would be. So was this based around people not having the, the garage space or the tools themselves to, to work on things? That was the original, like, reason for it. When I came up with the idea in 1995, when I had an old Volkswagen, the idea was people that don't have garages and tools and space could come in and put their car up on a lift and use all the stuff and get it fixed. And then 20 years later, I realized it'd be easier with motorcycles. And I thought that the big attraction would be the space and the tools but I get a lot of people that join that have the space and the tools. They have their own garage with everything they need, but they don't have the community and the social aspect of it. So they, they pay to bring their bikes here and work on them here. And they're not allowed to bring their own tools in. I have everything and they do all the work here. And and I always question like, are you sure? I, I don't want you to spend money on something that you don't need. And they're like, no, 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 the social aspect, getting the help of all the guys, getting the advice, getting the ideas, making new friends, finding people to ride with. That's turns out that's the reason that uh, that it's doing as well as it is. That's great. So how many members do you have right now? Uh, at the beginning of March, I had about 40, 45. Nice. And at this point, it's kind of hard to tell how many I have. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I, I hate to date things on podcasts because people always listen back to these, you know, maybe years from now. But we are in the middle of a pandemic right now. So how has this uh, how has this affected the the community based the anti community garage? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's it's been closed. I just started letting the members come back in. And I have to use the, you know, must wear a mask and have to keep your distance from people. And hopefully, like, I'm going to have to start somehow having people almost like put their time on a calendar so that 
we don't get 20, 30, 50 people in here at the same time. And usually that's when this place is the best is when there's 20 people in here hanging out and working on bikes. And now I'm going to have to try and enforce it to only be like four or five or 10 at a time mm. to try and keep distance from everybody. So I don't know. I don't really know what to expect in the next couple months. Right. And I think it sounds like you're in the same boat as everybody, except for you're telling the truth that you don't know what to expect. <laughs> you're not yeah. making any, <laughs> any predictions of how things are going to go. Yeah. It's freaking me out. Yeah. Well, let's go. Okay. So you said 90, 95, this was your idea. 1995. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So are you living in Cleveland then? No, I was living in Los Angeles. I had a 1975 Volkswagen bus and, uh, you know, like the billions of people that live out there, I was living in a place that did not have, I didn't have tools. I didn't have space. And there's so many apartment dwellers out there that eventually my mechanic felt bad for taking my money over and over and over to keep fixing my Volkswagen. He started lending me his tools. And then I asked him one day if I could use his lift. And he was like, no, 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 you, my insurance would drop me, you know, like a hot potato. You can't use my lift. And I was like, well, will anybody let me use their lift? And he said, no way. And immediately I thought, how cool would it be if there was a place that had like a dozen lifts and a mechanic on duty and you could pull in and he would give you some tips and you'd rent the tools for an hourly rate. And everyone I told the idea to was like, oh, that's such a cool idea. But I was 24 years old and. I was living off a bag of Fritos and a Snapple a day and I didn't have any money for shit. So right. I just sat on the idea for 20 years until I had enough in retirement and 401ks that I could quit my job teaching high school and cash out all my retirement and start it up. Nice. Yeah. I was looking through, uh, doing some research, some, some recon on you and, uh, you're a high school teacher. Wait, yeah. World, world history. Uh, that my, yeah, my degree was social studies, but, uh, you know, sometimes you teach where the school needs you. So I went from history to geometry, to computers, to algebra, to back to computers. It was pretty wow. exhausting. Yeah. So how many years did you teach for? Uh, 10. 10. Yeah. And just just had it just needed a change in your life or what was the deal yeah uh you know all 10 years were spent uh, in the city you know doing inner city teaching and and that's got a whole level of challenges that i was totally down for um you know you a lot of the kids that we were teaching came from less than ideal households and some didn't have too many role models. So a lot of the teachers in the inner city become the coach, the friend, the father, the mother, the aunt, the uncle, the teacher, the babysitter, the, the everything. And, uh, it's really rewarding, but it's extremely exhausting and it just kind of takes every bit of your life out of you. And then add on top of that, having to teach a different subject every year and, uh, yeah, it just, I just got fried way faster than I thought. I thought I was going to last 20 or 30 years and right. I only, only lasted 10 and lost my mind and decided to cash it all in and finally follow the dream and open the garage. Okay. So why LA, why Cleveland? Uh, I was born and raised here. Oh, okay. And I moved to LA in 93 and stayed there for seven years. Nice. How was LA? really fun yeah i bet <laughs> yeah it, it was it was a really good time i <clears throat> made some great friends and uh i got married for the first time out there and my wife she was a manager of bands you know so she managed like rob zombie and pantera and static and all these great metal bands and i was super into metal so we just got oh, to see no shit free shows every single night of the week and i mean every night of the week i mean free shows free drinks uh met all kinds of rock stars it was super duper fun and uh 
but you know, I was young and dumb and <clears throat> wasn't ready for marriage and ended up going through my first divorce and coming back home and getting my degree and then going into teaching. Cool. But yeah, LA was a, uh, was a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, I was just speaking with somebody earlier talking about like chapters of your life and that sounds like a really cool just chapter of your life to move on from, but great stories. Yeah. It was super fun. Yeah. Well, I've been married 17 times. So if you've only been married twice, it's not so bad. And I'm on my third now. Oh, you're on your third. You got married oh, yeah. a third time. Yeah. I have not done that, honestly. <laughs> so, <laughs> number three, third time's a charm. I bet no one said that to you before. Oh, no, no, no one's ever said that. No, no. Well, that just says you got a lot of personality in your ADHD or something. You got to move from one thing to the next. And yeah, <laughs> but things are good now. You're happy. Everything's great. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Things are great. Now, does she have anything to do with the shop? She does. She has quite a bit to do with it. Uh, she really kind of pushed me in directions that I wasn't really thinking about as far as how to market the place and how to be more open to a diverse uh, population of members. So she's kind of guided, um, guided the growth of the of the garage really nice. uh, she's been extremely important in helping me make the right decisions on who to accept as a member because you can't i don't accept everyone that comes in here wanting to join because all it takes is one racist douchebag who can't get along with everybody else in the garage to ruin the entire culture of the place so I have to guard the culture of this garage with my life. And yeah. I didn't really think about how important it was, but she knew from the, from the get go that that was like going to be the most important facet of the garage. So she's been really important to the, to the uh, success of this place. Yeah. Isn't it funny how you can have your ideas and have totally one thing and then you get a good partner in crime like that to kind of just steer it to make it successful yeah. and help everything out. That's awesome. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, no, that's super cool. All right, so how long did it take, like, when you started this? Did it pick up right away? Was everything, like, Shit. get go? Or did it take a long time? <laughs> Fuck, it took so long. Uh, I got the keys to my first location in January of 15 and spent like three months building all the, the workbenches and all the lifts with the, all the donated lumber that people had under their front porches. And I wasn't really able to open the door until late March. And I don't think I saw the first paying member come in till April or May. And I think up until maybe mid 2016, I don't think I ever had more than, maybe 15 members at one time and it was dreadfully slow. Yeah. But it's a little, a little I did, scary. <laughs> yeah. Super scary. And <laughs> you know, when I, I got to do that silly TV show where I met Craig Rodsmith at wrench against the machine and those producers led me to believe that this was going to be the game changer. And, they weren't going to pay me much money to be the host of the show, but oh, they promised that it would be this huge commercial that would make me just explode. And I was like, sweet, I'm in. And it didn't do fuck all. It introduced me to a lot of cool people and I made a lot of great connections, which ended up being helpful in the end. But the show was kind of a flop and the network folded immediately. And I didn't really get any new members out of it. The, the one thing that really made the difference was the uh, international motorcycle show that travels around. Yeah. You know, it goes to Chicago and Cleveland and Dallas and a couple other places They came in. They've been coming to Cleveland for years and years. And I got to go there and give some presentations one weekend. And it, I went from like 15, 20 members to 40 members in a matter of like a month after that. Kick ass. So that was kind of the, the turning point of 
being able to break even. But that was, yeah. I think, maybe in the January of like 17. So it took quite a while. Yeah. And <laughs> thank God for being able to present stuff like that in front of people and having that yeah. those kind of opportunities. All right, yeah. I want to I, I want to shift gears. Uh, so so wrench wrench against the machine. So was this was this your idea? Is this your love mm. child or brain child no. or whatever you want to go? No, it it was the producer's idea, and their really? idea was actually different than what happened. Their idea producers. I went to high school with one of the guys, and okay. he contacted me and said, "Hey, I just you know." Uh, I've been seeing your Facebook posts about this business you opened and it looks really cool. And I think there's somehow there's a TV show in there somewhere. We just got to flesh it out. And so we talked for months and came up with what we thought were some cool ideas. And we made that little, we made a little like teaser, you know, or whatever you call it, a sizzle reel where it was kind of like a, right. a fake show and they shopped it around. And, and when the Esquire network bought it they just changed the fuck out of it you hear that all the time man it was love... really fun though i mean like i i would do it all again yeah but but it wasn't it wasn't at all what it was meant to be the the guys the original producers were they had some really cool ideas and if we got to stick to them i think it would have been a better show but i still thought it was a good show so really yeah, I thought it was good. Well, maybe because I, mean, I was standing a little too close to it because, um, yeah, well, with Craig being on there, and it, it's cool looking back for me to just to see, like, just that episode. Like, with, holy shit, that was stacked. <laughs> that was stacked. How cool was that? That was like, okay, so how did that ha though? Did you have to help find these guys? Did you know people, or how did they find people? No oh, shit, I didn't know anybody. I really? didn't know yeah, I I didn't know anyone in the motorcycle industry whatsoever. <laughs> uh so there was a guy who was my co host who shall remain nameless. Uh he led the producers to believe that he knew fucking everybody. And uh he knew a couple people or knew of them and somehow between his couple connections and the producer's connections and some other people's connections, somehow they got the biggest names to be on that show. And I got to be totally honest with you. I didn't know one of their names when they showed up to every single episode, every <laughs> week when we started a new one, I had <laughs> no clue who any of them were zero. Wow. The only person I'd ever heard of, and I didn't even know why I'd ever heard of him, was Roland Sands. That's that's great, though. It's actually... I guess. No, I mean, what a cool way to meet everybody, though. That's yeah, fun. Yeah. Super yeah. cool. Wow. Yeah, it's too bad that that didn't work. Actually, I, I always tell the story because we had a little party for Craig up here when the show aired, you know, against his will. But that's the day that my son was born. So I watched like the rerun from the hospital and <laughs> it cut off right at the end before they show who won. Oh. So it was like my internet connection. So I had to wait to get home because he was fucking with me and wouldn't tell me. <laughs> he actually kept a secret. He didn't tell me. Whoa. Yeah. Asshole. That was his, his 72 hours was maybe the craziest out of all of the all of the shows really oh my god that was insane to watch what he did and then for, <laughs> for the thing to get fried <laughs> right <laughs> jesus christ i know but it's not even if if they would have done it and everything would have went perfect, the story would not be as good as it is. True, true. So I think in hindsight, it's kind of like, oh. And then knowing what it was now, other than, you know, at that time going, oh, shit. But yeah, we've heard some cool stories. Actually, if you want to listen to some fun ones, uh, Justin Webster was talking about it. Um, 
Justin's a great dude, man. Oh my and, god, he is the nicest guy ever. Isn't he? Jeez. Justin, he's got a good story on how he got picked too, because I don't think he he got back from his first hand built show, and then had like an email <laughs> something, and he didn't, and they asked him to get three guys, and he said that him and uh, Josh Allison, like, really didn't know each other, just saw each other at the show. So after the show, then he just called Josh, and then. Yeah, so it's and, kind of... and I don't think they even knew Chaston either. No. Nope. <laughs> no. So, and I know Craig had two guys, or no, he had one guy. And the last one, up until the final decision was made, almost was going to be me. Holy shit. Because he, he worked by himself, man. Like, but I could, like, get instructions, except for I don't know shit about shit if I had to go pick up tools. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. It probably wouldn't have been me. If I, and they would need somebody to get beers or coffee or something, I'd, I'm the right fucking choice for that. But that's about it. <laughs> All right, let's get back to the garage, man. Um, because, the okay, you guys have got a shit ton of press, too. Like, everything I look up, I'm like, yeah, I think you've done really well for unless they're all, like, at the same time. But it seems like Cleveland is, um, the news channels have been, you know, pretty good support for you guys, haven't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 The uh, the local news channels. I think the garage has been featured on each one of them like two, two or three times over the past maybe three years only. It's been insane. Right. That's really nice. Yeah. Well, and you guys have done some special stuff. So, uh, Moto Go. Is that how you say it? Moto Go. Moto Go. Yeah. All right. Tell me what that is. The shop class. So yeah. So Moto Go is. Uh, a nonprofit that my wife Molly and I started. And the idea was to bring shop class back because it's pretty much gone. I don't know if it's gone around the country, but it's definitely gone in most of Ohio. Yeah. It and is. Uh, when I was a teacher, uh, actually at a high school across the street here, I had the opportunity to bring some motorcycles into the school and hang out with like, eight kids for the week and do nothing but work on motorcycles with them. <laughs> and cool. I thought in one week we'd be able to tear these things down and put them back together. But I was, uh, stymied from the very beginning because none of them had ever used a, a pair of pliers or a screwdriver or a wrench before. Uh -huh. And I wasn't anticipating that. It didn't occur to me that these kids didn't grow up with, you know, a dad in the basement with a tool bench that was fixing things and doing things. They had no exposure to this whatsoever. So we didn't get much done in that week. We took a lot of things apart and we stripped a million screws and rounded out tons of bolts and nuts. And we fucked a lot of shit up, but we didn't get things put back together. And I always thought that someday it'd be cool to somehow bring shop class back to schools. And <clears throat> after the garage was kind of about to stand on its own, Molly and I decided to take the plunge on the nonprofit because we just weren't busy enough trying to run one business. And <laughs> we, we, so we bring old CB 350s to schools and the kids come and we walk them through tearing the thing down and tearing the engine apart and replacing all the gaskets and replacing all the parts and putting it back together. And then on the last day of class, they get the kick started. And it's been wildly successful, way more okay. successful than my for-profit garage has been. Hmm. And it's, um, I don't know, it's weird because all these schools are just dying to to have shop class back, which makes you wonder why the fuck did you get rid of it in the first place? But, you know, it wasn't really <clears throat> the school's decision, you know, between right. insurance and the state wanting testing done on English, math and science and not on shop class and schools have to focus on what the state mandates. And so they're, the schools are just getting in line to have us bring these motorcycles to the schools and I think if you were to tell kids, hey, we're going to learn how to fix a lawnmower, I don't think any kid would want to sign up. 
but when you wheel in a motorcycle, you wheel in three motorcycles and three bays of tools and say, you're going to learn how to fix a motorcycle. All the kids want to sign up. And hmm. it essentially, the motorcycle is just kind of a, you know, a lure because all we really want to do is get them to use tools and learn how to use tools safely. And if they can start using tools, then they can start fixing their world around them and they can start manipulating all the broken shit in their world. And to get girls, holy shit, girls are so much better at this than any boy that we have. Really? Taught. It's insane. <laughs> the girls listen better. They read the directions. They follow directions. They try harder. They are way better at every step of it than almost all the boys. They're so they're such a pleasure to teach. And so, yeah, it's basically some schools want us in there three times a week. Some schools want us in there once a week. Sometimes it's before school. Sometimes it's during. Sometimes it's after. Sometimes they come here to Skidmark Garage. Uh, some of them built a permanent space for us and we leave the bikes and tools there. Some of them, we have to bring a trailer and wheel the bikes into the cafeteria with the tools and the kids have class with us. And then when they're done, we got to roll it all back into the trailer and take off. So uh -huh. we're really doing everything we can to be in every school that we can. And, uh, the foundations are just loving it and the schools are loving it and corporations are wanting to pitch in to help it's become really uh exciting and it's growing faster than we could have ever imagined wow when i first read about it i didn't realize that it was a mobile a mobile school. yeah yeah wow what doors does that open that's so much better than having to have everybody come to you yeah yeah and yeah, that was the original thought was, you know, uh, we thought, well, schools probably don't have the money for the transportation to bring them to the garage, so we'll bring it to them. And the original idea, the original iteration was to have, like, a gigantic trailer and have the class in the trailer. And the kids cool. would come out to the trailer, and they would have it in the trailer, and then we could just go from school to school to school. But uh, that idea was... Wow, it sounds neat. Jamming twelve kids into a even a semi trailer with all the tools, it would be insane and dangerous and crowded and lame. So we were pretty surprised when one school said uh, it was actually an all girls Catholic school. They the nuns gave up their garage and said, Put your moto go in our garage and we we went and they paid for all the tools and bought the bikes from us and i had the girls build the workbenches and i had the girls build the lifts and they uh we, you know, we did one semester with one group of girls and then we started the second semester and they were well on their way to getting everything perfect and then you know the world fell apart right Wow. So how old are the, these are high, high school? Yeah. The, uh, the, the all girls school is a high school, but then we do a lot with middle schools. Um, yeah, we, I think the youngest we're doing is seventh grade. If we go any younger than that, it's some of the, like literally some of the torque specs are just too much. You know, they, they can't, they don't have the strength to, break a bolt and they don't have the strength to tighten one down to the you know the torque spec so going younger than seventh grade is is a little tough all right well it's kind of cool how you put these these two things together your your teaching and and the garage and you kind of you kind of still are a teacher yeah 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 and I, it's it's kind of like on my own terms too which is the best i don't have to go to faculty meetings i don't have to turn in like all these bullshit curriculum unit plan garbage Ugh. meetings are the worst like just the fucking worst and i get to do i get to like make the rules and if a school doesn't like the way that i'm doing it then they don't sign up for it and i just go to the next school because someone else is waiting in line so it is truly 
the best. And I get to get my hands dirty all day long, every day. It's so fucking fun. <laughs> that is badass. You know what? So do you see the same kind of um, community thing? I'm sure it's probably really cool to watch these, like, especially like the girls come together and, and work on a project. It's a, a different kind of socialization for them than playing, you know, TikTok with each other. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's really great to watch and, you know, and, and it's based as weird as it sounds to say, uh, it's based on failure. The whole idea is let them fail. And thanks to uh, common motor, down in Texas, who is like the 350 supplier who is sponsoring the program, we are encouraging these girls to just dive in and they fuck shit up. All these students in every program we have, they, they screw, they, uh, you know, they round things out and they strip the screws and it doesn't matter because the three CB 350s are pretty easy to come by and relatively inexpensive. And with Common helping out so much in this program and supplying us with the parts, you know, you don't learn how to not strip a screw until you strip a screw. So we let it happen and we let it happen organically. And we, we tell them, okay, you got to take this, you know, take the head off. And I'm like, well, how? Well, here's the manual, read the manual. And climbers donated the manual. So they read the manual and we tell them how to use the tool. And then we just let them, make mistakes and they make mistakes and they make mistakes and then they get it right. And they don't even know that they're making mistakes until they get it right. And once they get it right, they kind of turn to me and look, I'm like, Oh, I was doing it this way and this way. And that's why this happened. And that happened. And just seeing them light up and then helping each other and telling each other how to do it. You just get to step back and watch the magic. And it's just the greatest thing ever. Right. And I'm, I I like it because I, I think that, you know, kids, especially they learn different ways. Some kids aren't good at sitting, reading textbooks and listening to lectures that some kids get their yeah. hands dirty in here and probably flourish. Yes. Yes. And, uh, one of the other things that one of the added benefits is like, I don't know about you, but when I was in high school, I didn't really, I don't know that I can ever say that I, understood learning you know there was a lot of memorization i just memorized because i thought the whole point was to pass tests Correct. and it wasn't until i was in my 20s that after flunking out of college once and going back and realizing how badass learning is and all of a sudden i just i couldn't learn enough and that was all spawned because my roommate and i took the engine out of my Volkswagen and we just followed a manual, the idiot's guide, the original idiot's guide. And after that, I was like, holy shit, I learned how to do something I never thought I could do. And it changed everything. And so I know that there's a lot of students out there that are just memorizing to get through things. And they don't even know, they think they're learning, but they're just memorizing. And as soon as they get their hands dirty and they learn by doing, then then the whole like motivation to learn has been woken up in their brains. And it's, it's so much better that it happens when they're a teenager instead of in their twenties. Like when it happened to me, there were so many years wasted and I hate to see that happen. Right. Wow. And you know, it's, it's funny what you're talking about. Cause I hear this from guys that are, that are, you know, built building motorcycles like on their own, like, this is a, <laughs> you're not learning anything unless you fuck it up. Like the more mistakes you make, they just, and I think guys like Craig and, and other guys, the, the advice they give is, you know, try it, push yourself to do something you don't think you can do. Yeah. And it may be, you know, you don't get it the first time, you don't get it the second time, but just keep doing it. It's the, really, it's the same as ad, with adults. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, but that must be really rewarding to watch these guys and gals in there, like, you know, and who knows, maybe someday you'll see one of these guys working at a, you know, <laughs> at a shop somewhere and you'll be like hey you know you changed my life yeah yeah and and that would that would be pretty that would be pretty badass for that to happen and we don't uh we're not trying to push them into the trades or push them into anything in in our opinion learning how to use tools and learning how to fix things is going to make you a more well-rounded and better human and better citizen and better person 
whether you decide to go into journalism or become a doctor or become a mechanic or work on a, an assembly line or become a stay at home, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it just makes you better at everything. All right. So now that you're racking on, on both of these things, what's, what's, what's next? Are you, are you satisfied with where everything's at? Are you going to push forward? Do you have a, a bigger plan? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I've, uh, you know, that Sunday night feeling you used to get when you were a kid and you'd go to bed and you'd have that weird stomach ache because you knew that you forgot about a test the next morning or something. And I've had yes. that for like three or four weeks now and it's just constant diarrhea. I, I don't know what the fuck is going on, but I've had that Sunday night stomach pit and I don't know if if I'm forgetting something or if something big is about to happen or if I fucked something up and I'm about to become destitute. Uh, I think Moto Go is, I, I don't know that there is a next big step planned uh, for, for anything. I think Skidmark's probably going to have to move, and we're going to probably have to get a bigger space. We got ten thousand square feet now, and I think we're going to need thirteen to fifteen pretty soon. Wow! And Moto Go uh, is going to need its own space, also. And I think, you know, I get a lot of people that email me and call, and they ask about franchising Skidmark Garage or opening a second location and I don't have it in me. I didn't yeah. do this the legitimate way of documenting and a business plan and uh, all kinds of formalized processes. I, I didn't do any of that shit. So there's no way I could open a second one or franchise it. But MotoGo, because it's a nonprofit, has a board and they are insisting that everything gets done properly. And we're thinking that if we can make everything, you know, if we document and create manuals and expectations and responsibilities and roles that, you know, in maybe five years, this could be like a package that gets bought by other places and other cities and shop class gets brought back all over the country. Wow. But between now and then, I don't know that anything gigantic is... There just is getting, no neck. Just getting shit back to normal is next, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just kind or of the surviving. new normal. Yeah. Yeah. That sucks. And a shameless plug, though. So if someone um, listening right now or knows someone that wants to help donate as a nonprofit, obviously you guys need funding for this. Um, how can they yeah. go about uh, supporting it? Uh, they can go to, on Facebook, it's Moto Go Cleveland. And or you can go to motogocleveland.com and go to the website and find the donate button there. Uh, you can go to motogocleveland on Instagram. Uh, all those will have some sort of link somewhere to lead you to donate or you know buy a T-shirt or something. All which, which helps a great deal. Right, I'm getting out and buying a T-shirt today. I'll be sporting it. Awesome. Yeah, Thank since you. you've since you've only said fuck ten times, if you go over fifteen, I'm not buying anything, <laughs> <laughs> or I have to buy one for every time you say it. <laughs> yeah. I think we need to get buy one, and send one to Rod Smith, and have him wear it around the shop. That would oh. be fun. Yeah, yeah, and then we got to get some back and great. doing some fun videos over there. That would that would be good yeah. too. Um, okay, so um, I was just looking through here, man. You've had a, you've had really an interesting run at all this that I'm sure that you didn't think when you were teaching and everything that it was going to end up like this. No. It's cool. Re regarding the garage or the nonprofit? Yeah, both. I, yeah. I think it's just kind of cool that you're, 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 you're back in the saddle. You're making a difference. And these kids, maybe that's the TV show. The kids making this stuff, a build off between, you know, high school kids that don't know anything. That's kind of a cool idea. Yeah, Although, maybe I, I'll jump in with the kids since I don't know shit about anything, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it wouldn't. Unfortunately, when I 
did that show, I had to sign a contract that said I would never do another build off type TV show competition motorcycle thing for like the next like 20 years or something stupid, even though that doesn't exist anymore. Hmm. So there could wow. be another show in there somewhere. And I think it'd be pretty cool to show just bringing back shop class and following kids around. But it unfortunately couldn't be a build off type thing. Right. Well, they won't know. At least we're not talking about it on, on a forum that people are listening to this. So <laughs> we'll sneak this one under the radar, man. It'll be easy. <laughs> what kind of do you have to deal with any? I'm sure you have to like um, li- or liability purposes, like for the for the garage itself and for and for going to schools. How do you handle that? Uh, it took a long time. Um, I I started a network of community garages, and we all kind of get together over, you know, email and social media, trying to help each other out. Cause there's a, at one point there was about 40 of us around the world. Now it's back down to probably 20 or 30. And I created it in hopes that we could all share ideas. And one of the main problems I was having when I first opened was how do I get insurance? And when I opened in 15, there was only maybe five or six other community garages out there. Hmm. And insurance was an issue for everybody and I couldn't find it. And so for the first three years I was open, I didn't have insurance, which was insane, but it's tough. I, I did it anyway. And then eventually, uh, I found a, uh, an insurance guy that only does like high risk things like bungee jumping and skydiving and shit. And Mm -hmm. he was totally down for, you know, helping me out. And he went through and took a look at everything and and knowing that, you know, that there's a bar in here and that people are bringing in beer and they're having a beer while they work on bikes and that there's concerts that happen in the garage and there's major events that happen in here. And there's tools in here that you can really, you know, lose a finger with and stuff. He was, he got me decent insurance and, Basically, all it does is get me a lawyer in case I get sued so I don't go out of business. Because right. if someone wants to sue me, even though they've signed all the waivers and shit, they can right. still try. They can still drain my bank. But, mm-hmm. uh, and so then I, you know, shared that information with the rest of the community garages. And I think that that guy got quite a bit of business out of it. And right. the same insurance company helps us out with Moto Go also. And, it took a long time to find, but once we found them, they're, they're great. And they pretty much cover everything. And it's, I don't have to worry anymore. Thank God. Right. No, so I didn't know you guys had a bar in there and you have events. Yeah. Yeah. We got a, a 2000 square foot uh, lounge and <laughs> I have a, a 25 foot like pre-war bar. And <laughs> one of the members owns a brewery. So he pays for his membership with kegs. <laughs> and the beer is always free for the members and members usually bring beer in. And if there's beer in the fridge, it's like free game. And I don't sell any beer cause I don't have a liquor license. And then I'd say a couple times a month, we have a couple bands that'll play in here. We'll rearrange the lounge and we'll get between 10 and 90 people in here to see a show. And some people rent out the lounge for weddings and birthday parties, birthday parties and, little private gatherings, Christmas parties. That's kick ass. Yeah, it's a cool cool little it doesn't bring a ton of money in, but it gets me exposure that I otherwise wouldn't be able to get. Sure. No, it's got to be really rewarding that they I mean, so especially you being the the uh, the master mechanic that you pretty much know everything about uh you're a mechanic, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> So people don't people don't come there and say, Brian, you need to help me out. You need to do this. Uh, yeah, they do. They they often come in and expect me to. A lot of guys come in and they expect me to do the work, and oh. they don't understand. You know, because the idea of a DIY community motorcycle garage isn't something that's very common, and so it's a very foreign idea, and they don't when they ask if I can fix it, I say, no, you fix it. 
and they don't understand. And then I explain it and they still don't understand. And then, so then they come in and I give them a little tour and then they kind of understand what the place is about. And then they still ask me if, well, can I just pay you like on the side to fix, fix my bike? And the, a, I'm not a mechanic. I don't know shit. B, <laughs> if anyone works on anybody else's bike in here and the, the city or the county or the state finds out, then my business license is screwed because I'm technically not a garage. I'm not subject to all the, the fees and the inspections and all the licensing stuff because we don't have licensed mechanics in here and we don't do that stuff. Everyone's working on their own deal. So it's kind of like a private club. Mm-hmm. So no one's allowed to work on anybody else's stuff. And when people come in and ask me to work on their shit, it just turns into like a 30 minute explanation on why I can't do it. Yeah. I, I, I kind of understood the concept from the, the DIY, like the do it yourself thing. Kind of explained it. Kind of explained it to me, (laughs) but (laughs) you never know, brother. (laughs) You never know how that happens. There's some people that have never heard the term DIY. Wow, maybe they've never been married to a crazy crafting woman, or or turned on, (laughs) or turned on any TV ever. Everything's DIY. Yeah, there's been a million phone calls when the when I go, no, 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 this is a DIY garage, and they go, what's DIY? (laughs) <laughs> really it means do it yourself i'm like oh okay well what do you mean do it yourself i don't know how to do it i'm like yeah okay dude um, yeah no that's great though see i'm glad that you explained that to me because for some reason i had in my head like if you went there you had you know a couple buddies and you would like be helping each other out but it's legitimately like you work on your bike well you can bring your buddies and you know, you brought a couple of friends, you could all work on your bike and the guy next to you needs help. You can give him some assistance, but, uh, there's been a couple guys in the past that have said, you know, dude, a said to dude B, Hey, I'm going to leave and I'm coming back next week. If I give you 300 bucks, can you have this done for me by the time I come back? And dude B comes to me and says, Hey, this was just asked of me. And I don't know what to do. So then I have to go and re-explain the whole thing to everybody. Because the last thing I want is to get in that kind of trouble. Sure. And you're protecting everybody. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's tough to be the bad guy sometimes, though. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. I was reading some article um, about the garage, and I thought it was interesting that someone asked you about, uh, were you worried about theft? Oh, about yeah. people stealing tools from you. Yeah. And and it wasn't just one person. Like when I started telling people about what I wanted to do, you know, like all of 2014, I was telling everyone, this is what I'm going to do. This is my dream. This is what I'm going to open. And I'd explain it and explain it and explain it. And every single person's response was, well, how are you going to keep track of the tools? What, aren't people going to steal the tools? And And they convinced me that they would. And I thought I'd have to come up with this way of inventorying every single bench every time someone walked away and keeping track of all the stuff. And I spent so much time coming up with plans. And there has never been so much as, you know, a a socket that's been stolen from here. That's nobody steals from here. And, And the members that I originally asked, like, You know, don't you think, am I ever going to have a problem with people stealing stuff? And the members looked at me like, why would we steal? Because it's essentially ours anyway. We'd be stealing from ourselves. It just doesn't make any sense. Like, holy shit, you guys are taking such ownership of this place that (laughs) you're not stealing and you're protecting it from others. And it blew my mind. And it's so refreshing that there are good humans left. Yeah. Um, Yeah, because it's funny that that's probably a common question because people have to deal with the non-good humans all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. like people stealing names and shit like that. And yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of bad stuff, but it sounds like everything there is super positive. And I I think that hopefully with bouncing back for this, all this is going to pay back tenfold to you, brother, that, that you can get this thing going back and get the schools open too. Cause I'm sure you're, you're can't wait to get out and 
work with the kids again too. Well, we we did a little pivot and we're doing online shop class, which sounds insane, but Climber and Haynes have this V8 model engine that's clear and you can see it all moving inside and they donated like I think 50 of them to us. So we really? sent those out to kids and then we do Zoom meetings with like 12 kids at a time and I walk them through building this V8 engine and I supplement it with, you know, YouTube videos of like how crankshafts are made and how valves are made and how timing works and all that kind of bullshit. And then I also, I, I'm so pumped about this idea, but it's not <laughs> taking off like I thought. We <laughs> delivered uh, five CB350 engines to five households and delivered a chest of tools to each one of those households and every saturday i meet with those five kids and we are taking the whole engine apart and i provided them with the gaskets and all the replacement parts and they're going to put it all back together and then at the end of five weeks i drive around and i pick up all the tools pick up all the engines and i bring them to another five kids for five weeks and i have in my attic i dragged 10 cb350 engines up to my attic and i created a little studio up there and i have like an iPod or an iPad above the engine. So there's an overhead view. And then I have one like on the bill of my hat so you can see what my hands are doing. And I've got all these lights shining on the engine and I That's provided awesome. everyone with the torque wrenches and they're learning how to do all the stuff and they're like holed up in their garages and basements. And it is so fucking cool. That's but, badass. But uh, I just, we got to find more funding for it because a lot of families can't afford 600 bucks to do that. Right. Wow. And where it's, do you have the, where do you have the time for all this stuff? That sounds like a huge commitment, man. <laughs> it is, man. It is, <laughs> it is a huge commitment, but you know, because of this virus, I haven't left the house in like 10 weeks. So true. I'm just yeah. doing it. Right. It's like, where do I have the time to bust out 65 podcasts? And you know, most people do that in a year. I don't know where I have had the time to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. I feel like I've been busier since the lockdown. I know. I know. Yeah, it'll be nice to get everything back to normal. We can sit and put our feet back up somewhere. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Or, or make some money. I mean, that would. There's another novel idea. You know. Yeah, that would be something. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> so, all right. So, since since you're uh, once again, Brian's a huge fanboy of the show, and he's listened to every podcast. <laughs> um, I feel so privileged, man, that you're taking the time out of your long, busy day. I think that we should have we got to put the the podcast on at the you know you got to introduce your folks to to the podcast. Heck you know, yeah, some of the biggest builders in the on the planet. You know, hell yeah, Plus, man. Plus my charming, you know, personality. Um, <laughs> so at the end of at the end of the podcasts, um, I ask everybody. So this started off. Uh, uh, the podcast started off in just kind of custom builders and things, and then as we've gone along, we've moved out to from artists to people like you to all kinds of things. So it's kind of a motorcycling podcast now. So mm -hmm. I like to I like to hear a couple people that you would say. I'd love to hear on the show that you would look and go, God, I got to listen to that guy or somebody that's been inspiring to you or somebody has a great story. Um, they, and they don't have to be famous. They don't have to be anything. Huh? I know it's a hard one. I put you, I put you on the spot. Mm. This is where I can edit too, brother. <laughs> uh, there's a dude here in Cleveland. Um, that is just a badass and I don't think he gets much uh notoriety and but he's and he's the nicest dude. His name is uh Alex I don't even know how to say his last name, like Rinskoff. But he used mm -hmm. to it's uh he used to build bikes under the name Strange Cycle. And he uh has been helpful in the garage. He's helped some of the members out and, and given helpful hints and he's just a super genuine great dude that uh he could he would be fun to have on the show he's a really good guy awesome and is, do you think he's on uh 
Oh, there he is. He's under Strange Cycle on Instagram. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, um, he rules. Alex, you're right. I have no idea how to say his last name either. I just cough during the, the end of it. But Alex would be <laughs> awesome. Um, anybody else you can think of off the top of your head? Uh, yeah, you actually. Can, you got a different like a... outlook on this. There's a, another um, mechanic in town. Uh, his he, his uh, shop is called Black Arrow Motorcycles. Black Arrow. His name is Mike. He is a badass vintage mechanic, and he races vintage, and he's the manager of a band, so he's always touring the world with this band. So he just... Super interesting, really nice, kind of soft-spoken, smart, awesome dude. He he'd be great to have on the show too. He's probably got some crazy stories. Yeah, what's what's his first name? Mike. Mike, man, there's a lot of black black arrow moto. Maybe. Uh, Let's see. Let me, let me check Instagram. Black arrow exchange. He's got a picture of Joe Diffie. Mm-hmm. Black Arrow Motorcycles. All one black. Word. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Cool, cool. Awesome. Well, those guys would be fun. I always yeah. look to, you know, it's it, the very rewarding thing about this job that I have is to um, talk to all kinds of different people. I talk to you. You got friends in Cleveland. I talk to a guy in, you know... <laughs> Vietnam, he's got you know everywhere from here to London to it's just cool because this whole community uh, all have a, a different outlook, but I think everybody's passion pretty much lies in the same place. Have you talked to Bob K? No, dude, Bob K K A Y. Yep, uh, he is like the godfather of all things motorcycle has been around the scene for years and years and is really a really nice guy. Uh, his, you can find him on Bob. Bob K's custom cult. Is that yes. him? Yeah. Yep. He's the fucking man. Where's he from? I believe he's living in, I think he lives in Texas. Okay, but he always okay. does the the full circuit of all the custom shows, uh, runs the IMS custom build shows, and I'm sure Craig knows him. Yeah, he's just a really really good dude and a wealth of knowledge. Has been in the industry for so long and has been really kind to the garage. Cool, it's nice to have those guys as supporters. Who's the other um, uh, common? They they help you guys out a lot. Do they have an Instagram page that at least I can tag them in here and give them a shout out? Yeah, I think I think they're just common motor. Okay. Yeah, I like to give uh, some respect, especially people that are uh, that are that are helping out. Uh, common motor, common motor collective. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, they were originally a community motorcycle garage, just like Skidmark, but they've uh, kind of just become like the supplier of three fifty stuff. Very cool. Very cool. Anything else you want to mention about the about the garage or your pole dancing career or anything like that? No, no. Except we covered diarrhea. We did. Dude, we did. But we... that we covered <laughs> we covered diarrhea um, during one of our initial emails back and forth. Um, yeah, Brian just said, "Yeah, we got to make sure to talk about diarrhea." As long as we talk about diarrhea, he'd be on the show. So, yeah, I mean, We're... you know the term skid mark has ah. dual meaning and there are no funnier jokes on the planet than poop jokes so it was just very fitting that this place became known as skid mark garage and so the members know that when i'm here i'm usually in the shitter and <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> you know what thing. if you take anything away from the show folks now you know what you're taking away the skid mark you'll never look at <laughs> never look at that logo the same <laughs> well brian hey brother thank you so much for being on the show we we really appreciate it and anybody Thanks listening 
hey, it's my pleasure. But anybody listening that, that just a couple extra bucks to throw um, that way would be awesome. I know it's uh, if you've heard the story, obviously, that um, it's going to a great cause and anything we can do to help. I think it's community, 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 community. Yeah. So cool. Your anti-community garage right now. Yes. Oh my god. Well, keep in touch, brother. I want to hear how everything kicks back off, and it'd be it. You know, make sure to give Brian a follow too at Skidmark, and the and the Moto Go as well. Um, Thanks, dude. That'd be cool. Yeah. Well, great to talk to you, brother. And we will catch up soon. All right. Later. See you, man.